Good morning, everybody. Hey, Dan. Everybody know each other now? This is, uh, got, got that awkwardness out of the way. Um, I've known you for a while. We uh, work together at Bloomberg. And, and we've had a lot of conversations about what you're looking to do here in Toronto. For those who aren't that familiar with it, what is it that you want to do that you'd like to build here? Well, fundamentally what we want to do is show how you can totally revolutionize urban life in the 21st century, given the tools that we have available to us today. So the idea is to develop a district on the waterfront, not too far from here, right downtown, that truly would be the ultimate expression of what is actually possible when you combine cutting edge innovation across, as Patty said, virtually every urban system with what we think will be great urban design. And, and so you spent several years thinking about where would be the best location for something like that. Like, what was that process like? So the first thing we did was we literally talked to people all over the world. Uh, we studied every attempt in the past to develop an urban innovation district or a smart city. Found most of them were really disappointing at the end of the day. Um, and developed a concept for what this could actually be. And then we started looking for cities. And, and what we really wanted was a, a city that was growing. Uh, we wanted a city that had a great tech ecosystem, and hopefully everybody's appreciating just how much we actually have here in Toronto. But what we were really looking for was a city that we thought would be open to the idea of new approaches. And one of the really interesting things Toronto has in common with many of the great cities of the world is that they're struggling with the success. You know, cities that are growing have to be able to accommodate the growth. And what we're seeing here in Toronto is that affordability is a huge problem. Uh, we're seeing that getting around is becoming a much greater problem. They've underinvested in mass transit. As a result, people who don't have money are getting pushed further and further away from centers of opportunity. And this is a place that really believes in inclusiveness. It's an important value here. It's open. Part of the reason there's so much growth is there's so many people from around the world flooding in. Over half the people in Toronto were born outside of Canada. And so paradoxically, what's happening is this openness is producing these pressures that are undermining their value. So we thought they would be very open to a new approach. So Sidewalk is part of Google's parent company, Alphabet. Yep. And if we think about things that Google has done over the years, as we take a look at some of these images, people sort of conceptually thinking about this right now, the Android ecosystem. So there was a world of developers building on that platform. Do you think of this kind of project like a platform? Well, we, we see a city to some extent as a platform in an individual location. You know, if you think cities have always been kind of platforms in the sense that, what's a street grid? It's a platform. You know, I'm from New York. I was deputy mayor of New York. And you think about the street grid, which was actually created 208 years ago. When it was created, the fastest vehicle was a horse, right? And then it accommodated, you know, it, it accommodated uh, L's and subways and then cars and now bike share and other things. In the future, it's going to accommodate autonomous vehicles. What we want to do is create the physical and digital infrastructure that enable not just us, but entrepreneurs and innovators from here and around the world to build on top of it so that the place never actually grows old. Right? As taste, technologies, and trends change, the infrastructure has to be able to accommodate. So from that perspective, we think of the city as a platform. We do think that if we're successful here, this idea has real legs and can be expanded globally um, in many different ways. But we have to make it successful here first. And look, that's not easy. He said we're innovating across virtually every system. So here you see wood buildings. Our proposal for this place next month, our full proposal will be a massive, incredibly detailed document is going to come out. But one of the staples of it, we think all the buildings should be made out of mass timber. Why do we think that? Because with factory automation, with great design by creating an entire supply chain kit of parts that can then be used to create really interesting designs, over time we can lower the cost of building buildings by 20%. 
Why does that matter? Because for the first time we'll actually be able to really enable people with less means to live downtown in Toronto. So all these pieces are new and different, come together, said we're innovating across virtually every dimension of urban life. And if I'm conceptually thinking of a developer who traditionally would develop, let's say, for the Android ecosystem, and they're, and they're seeing some of these images maybe for the first time, and to your point, we're still waiting for a little bit more detail ultimately on what the final proposal will be. What should they be thinking about? In other words, what would that collaboration look like longer term? Well, hopefully what we will do is we'll create open infrastructure, open systems, standards for data that make it very easy for the entrepreneurs and companies to come and try out what they're thinking about or new ideas in a place in which for the first time anywhere in the world you'll have all these systems operating together in an environment in which the system is really open. And, and that will represent a dramatic change to the way we think about building cities. So you use that word data, and I think that has come up time and again with, with this particular project. How are you treating the issue of data and privacy? I mean, this does seem like new territory on a lot of levels, but it involves one company uh, that a lot of times is in the headlines over these issues like data and privacy. Yeah, so it, it has clearly been the most controversial part of, of the project so far. I mean, we've literally been planning this in the open for 18 months, uh, but that's been by far the most controversial part, and we've decided we have to take a radical approach um, to the whole issue of what we call urban data, data collected in public or semi-public spaces for which there can really be no consent. And we know out in the world today, it's the Wild West, right? There are cameras everywhere, there are sensors everywhere. I can stick a camera outside the door here and with cheap computer vision technology, tell who's walking by. What we've said is that's not appropriate. It's not appropriate for society, and it's not right, actually, in a place where one company plays an outside role. So what we have proposed in contrast to the regimes all over the world for which there are no rules, is say, you know what, we should create an entity, a government-sanctioned, independent, uh, urban data trust that will have responsibility for oversight of all of this kind of data. We shouldn't be in charge. We should be subject to the same rules as everybody else. And so really what you'll have is the management of that data be completely subject to a democratic, independent process. There's nowhere else in the world that actually has that. We think it's appropriate for us. We think it's appropriate for everyone else, as long as everyone's on the same terms. Well, you, earlier you talked about would a city like Toronto be open to this idea, and I think you just look at this crowd today and you see there's a lot of interest in technology in this city. Those who have been vocal in opposition uh, to your involvement in this project sometimes speak to things like transparency, your own openness around it. Um, we're waiting for more details, more on the proposal side, but what would you say to those people? I, I'd say that is 100% unfair. You know, we have hosted dozens, maybe hundreds of fora and meetings. We've literally had, during the planning process, 20,000 people who we have met in person. We set up an office slash exhibition space down on the waterfront. We've had more than 10,000 people come down to see what we're doing. You know, we've conceptualized the street of the future in a world of autonomous vehicles with these really cool approaches to pavers that are heated, that can be dynamically lit, enable people to come and play with those things. Every single thing when we thought it was ready at least for public discussion, we've put out there. And then once the plan is done, literally next month, you know, there's going to be a whole other set of public review uh, of this. So I, I think, to be honest, we have been more transparent than virtually probably any other project I've ever seen. And, and you're saying, so that dialogue continue, you put Absolutely. the proposal out there and you keep that conversation going. Yeah. And then you alluded to the fact that, I mean, not to get ahead of ourselves here, but this could be some kind of template for other cities around the world, at least from where you guys sit? Yeah, not that we see lifting up what we do here and sticking it, you know, in some place in Europe or in the Middle East or Asia or another part of North America. 
But we are literally trying dozens of new approaches to mobility, to the environment. I mean, literally, we believe in this place for the first time, we can create a climate positive community, one that actually exports clean energy back to the grid. You know, across the way buildings, as I mentioned, are designed and built, across the way the place people interact with each other. So what we expect is, is that people will look to this place for inspiration and want to try pieces of it in other places. And that's the fastest way to actually bring about what we call sort of this fourth urban technology revolution. Now, if you think about our cities, they really haven't changed much, yeah. you know, over the course of maybe since before World War II. We get our heating the same way, we get our power, we get our water. If you look at our apartments, they look pretty much the same. Why? Because there has not been a true sort of technological revolution like the steam engine or the electric grid or the automobile in almost 100 years. We're ready for one now, given the availability of digital technology and the combination of those technologies, we think, are poised to fundamentally change cities for the better, to make them cheaper, to make them more environmentally friendly, to give people time back in their day, to create a better, better sense of community. But cities are afraid to try new things. And if we think by having models of that, uh, to look to will accelerate that whole trend. Does this have to feed in some way back into to the parent company's um, AI first mission? You know, obviously there's been a move away from just being mobile first to now machine learning, and we see all si uh, types of examples of that even at this conference, but with Google every day. Does that have to tie into this in any no, way? No, I mean, obviously to the extent that there are technologies that Google or Alphabet or their subsidiaries are developing, you know, we're free to take advantage of those. But we actually are not locked into any Google or Alphabet company at all. So we expect to be almost an independent platform for innovation. Um, that said, um, you know, said they're, they're a great resource for us and we hope to use them, you know, where it, where it makes sense. We're gonna make money here from real estate development, we're going to make money from infrastructure and thinking about new approaches to next generation infrastructure. We're going to make money hopefully from developing some products and services that get applied here first and then exported to other places. That's not, that's not like the Google or any other alphabet business model. Uh, building, especially when we're talking about real estate, these are, these are long-term commitments. Uh, anyone who's followed what you've done in New York and a lot of headlines recently around things like Hudson Yards knows that there is a long-term towards getting to that end goal. Depending on how things play out, um, beyond the initial commitment you made to, to this point, What's the time length for, for building something like this? Look, I mean, I think to build out the district that we're talking about, and we would only be responsible for developing the real estate on you know, a relatively small percentage to ensure that the innovations are actually feasible, they're commercially adaptable by others. Um, but we expect to be involved here either as an investor, as a developer, as an infrastructure provider, and then for the most part as an advisor over time for 20 years. Hmm. These things take time, but that doesn't mean we can't begin to see the real fruits from a quality of life benefit perspective within the next, what, within a few years after the place opens up. So you, there will be investing partners, like there was obviously some question about whether you might see, there's a new infrastructure bank in this country, there Absolutely. will be other investor partners in this project? Totally, I mean, we're very focused on bringing in Canadian partners, even in the real estate aspects of this, um, but also from an infrastructure perspective, we're very opening to partnering with people from a technology perspective. A part of this will be to encourage the local tech ecosystem to grow, one of the things that we will sponsor is the development, of what we're calling an urban innovation institute that would focus on urban innovation in this place, modeled on Cornell Tech uh, in New York. One thing we did here early on in this process, when we knew there was interest in the city and at government levels in, in, in maybe exploring something like this, is, is whether everybody got a fair shot. Um, 
you're working with a very large company. It's an influential company. And I think there were some in the tech community that wondered, did we get our fair shot to put our own proposal together? What would you say to that? Everybody had a fair shot. Uh, in fact, the whole project and process was independently reviewed. And I, the uh, person who reviewed it said that we simply submitted the best proposal. OK. So um, just to get back to time frame, we're saying, you know, perfect, you know, maybe this is like a five, six type. Well, the, the way the time frame works is we'll submit this plan next month. Um, it'll take several months to negotiate with government because everything has to be approved by, in relevant parts, the three levels of government plus the one entity that they've created in order to oversee development on the waterfront. That's going to take through the end of the year and into early next year. Good case, maybe even best case, we could be with the right approvals in the ground toward the end of next year. The first buildings could open up maybe at the end of 2023 or early 2024. And we plan to open up a whole set of them at the same time. One of the things that is really important, I think, can also just have a huge economic development impact for Toronto and for Canada, is we would significantly expand Google's presence in Toronto and move the head Canadian headquarters down to the waterfront, basically as a catalyst to economic development for what today is a completely underutilized waterfront. You know, this is waterfront that the city's been trying to develop literally since the early 20th century. Not the 21st century, the early 20th century. And we think we can be a big catalyst to something amazing happening on the waterfront. Now, you've been involved at the end of the day in, in some big projects over your career. What has been the biggest learning lesson with this for you so far? Yeah, look, I think planning out in the open is really hard. You know, people have an expectation that you know all the answers. And, you know, what we have said is, look, we, don't, we didn't have the answers when we came here. We had some hypotheses. We wanted to hear from Torontonians about what they want. We had to make this something that is important for the people here. And in a new culture, learning that, I think, was, was very hard. So there have been some occasionally painful lessons about cultural differences, about what's acceptable, what's not, sensitivities. And what we've tried to do is listen extremely well, um, reflect the feedback, and ultimately come out with something that hopefully people will find incredibly exciting because at the end of the day, this will be the most innovative district in the entire world. It will completely bend the curve on quality of life, we believe, across virtually every dimension of the way people live in cities. It will be, we think, a massive economic boon to this city, to this province, and to this country. And we hope what it does is it will also demonstrate to people around the world what's possible. And so when people think about urban innovation, they will look to Toronto as the place that it happens here most, most um, completely. Well, I've, yeah, I think you've piqued everyone's interest. Probably some of the lumber producers, too, all that wood. <laughs> My gosh, I don't know what the, the bill on that is going to be. Dan, thanks so much John, for sharing your always perspective always great to be with morning. you. And thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. You can probably just go back.